Okay, well, welcome to uh, the second lecture about blood vessels. So this is going to be lecture 16 for AMP 1105A. Um, so this is the second of, of three parts on the blood vessel. So we'll end up and finish this off uh, in the next lecture. And then the subsequent lecture will be about a different topic called lymphatics. And so the upload date for this is uh, November 11th, uh, 2020. So both lectures uh, 15 and 16 will be uploaded on this date. Um, so as I mentioned in my office hours, um, there's going to be a review session on Saturday, November 14th. So that's this upcoming Saturday. It's going to be at 10 a.m. Basically what this is, this is going to be kind of a live lecture of me hitting um, the, the, the highlights, so to speak, of um, lectures 13 and lectures 14. So those are the two lectures on the heart that are going to be on the midterm. So that's the only material from my stuff that's going to be on the midterm. So if you think that's going to be helpful, then then, then please uh, tune in and you'll see a Zoom link in the uh, in the Brightspace application. <clears throat> so what are what am I going to cover? Well, uh, basically, I want you to tell me. Um, and so so email me with things that, that you think you need a little bit more information about uh, or if you want me to explain it in a different way and, and I'll be sure to include that. If I don't hear from anybody then then I'll just hit kind of uh, the main topics um, that, that that I hit uh, in other years where I've done similar reviews. And so my email address is there and feel free to contact me. Um, so today what we're going to learn about is, is more about the blood vessels. We're going to focus more on the physiology. And I'll say at the outset is we have a guest uh, for this lecture. This is my dog Jack and I'm holding him so he doesn't bark well. Uh, my wife and I are both doing recordings this time. Um, and so you may see him pop up from time to time. Um, <clears throat> and so we're going to be focusing mostly on blood pressure regulation inside of these blood vessels. Okay. Um, and so just a review from last time. Um, I want to focus on a few main concepts just so everybody is on the same page. Um, and so we, we focused mostly last time on, on definitions um, and describing the structure of arteries, veins, and capillaries. Um, and if you remember, again, we're always going to have blood flow that goes from the arteries through the capillary veins and into the, into the, um, sorry, into the capillary beds and up through the veins. And you can see that the structures of these are, are very similar. So they've both got uh, a tunica intima. So intima is intimate. It's an intimate contact with the blood. The media, um, which is going to contain smooth muscle. And the externa. And so this is mostly collagen. Um, and we described that the arteries and the veins, although they, sorry, although they are very similar in structure, um, they're a little bit different in, in kind of the, the uh, amount of each layer that, that they have. And so arteries, for example, are, uh, are th have thicker walls overall um, and a narrow, narrow, narrower lumen. And so the lumer, lumen is the interior area that is in contact with the blood. The veins have a larger lumen, and we talked about these being called capacitance vessels. And so they contain up to 60% of the total blood in the, in the body at any one time. So if you remember last time, I showed you what the cross-section of these look like under a microscope. Uh, the capillaries are, are a much simpler structure. Um, in their most simple form, they contain, you know, just a single layer of endothelial cells, perhaps with a little bit of, of basement membrane. Um, and, and these are so small that, that really the smallest capillaries, you just have a single red blood cell that can pass through. And as we'll see as we progress through the course, this is something that's actually really important for, for gas exchange. Uh, when we talked about capillaries, we also talked about three different types. We talked about continuous capillaries. Um, these are the ones that make up most of your body, okay? Um, and they're, they're, they're continuous. They have um, gap junctions between cells. Um, but uh, these gap junctions are, are not always 100% tight. And so those two capillaries can actually, um, cells can actually pull apart a little bit and you get what are called intercellular clefts, okay? So intracellular clefts right here. This can allow passage of, of fluids and also small solutes. So what is a solute? Things like glucose, uh, ions, fats, things like this. Fenestrated capillaries, these are, are, are very similar except for they have small holes in their endothelial cells. Um, and these allow even bigger particles to pass through. We see these sometimes in the gut, for example, to aid in digestion. 
Lastly, I showed you an example of the sinusoidal capillaries. These have even larger holes in their, their um, endothelial cells that make up the capillaries. And they're so large that cells can actually reach into those capillaries and pull out things that shouldn't be there. And so one example might be a bacteria that has invaded into your body. So what are we going to learn today? Well, basically today we're going to be talking mostly about uh, blood pressure and how it's regulated at various levels. And then we will uh, pick up and finish that off in the next lecture. In this case, I've been a little bit more specific about uh, some of the areas in chapter 19 that you want to focus on. Okay, so these pages are particularly important, as is this figure, 19.10. Okay. Um, again, these web extras, this is just to supplement your knowledge. It's not something that, that uh, you're necessarily going to be examined on. It just might help to solidify what I'm already talking about in this lecture. So we'll start off with some definitions. Okay, so this is all about uh, a blood pressure and flow and a little bit of physics, actually. And so blood flow, blood flow is simply talking about the amount of, of liquid, in this case blood, that is moving through a, a vessel, an organ, or, or, or in some cases, uh, the entire circulation within a given period of time. Um, when we talk about blood pressure, blood pressure is the, uh, the force per unit <laughs> Uh, area exerted on on the wall of the blood uh, wall of the blood vessel by that bl uh, blood, and so um, you know just uh, blood pressure is the same as any other type of pressure. We're talking about a, a force per given area, okay? Um, and then we're going to talk about resistance. Uh, resistance. Sometimes I'll refer to it as peripheral resistance. This is opposition to flow. So same type of thing you might uh, hear about when we're thinking about electrical circuits. In an electrical circuit, you might have opposition to the flow of electricity. And if you've got opposition to the flow of electricity, um, that, that's going to uh, impact a blood pressure as well. So both of these concepts are something that, that's very important. Okay, um, so we're going to start and we're going to talk a little bit more about what generates resistance. Um, and there's three things that I want you to think about. The first is uh, blood viscosity. Um, and so viscosity means kind of how sticky the blood is. Um, and so you can think of it as, um, I always use this, this example of kind of a water bottle or a coffee cup or something like this. If you've got water in a, a water bottle, it, it's not very viscous. It comes out pretty easily. So if you invert that water, it, it'll kind of pour right out. Okay. Um, the, uh, the opposite might be something like a ketchup bottle. If you invert a ketchup bottle, usually you have to end up smacking it on the end of the bottle in order for that ketchup to come out. <clears throat> so this would, would be an example of higher viscosity. Hopefully your blood is never going to be the viscosity of ketchup, but the general idea is that uh, the more viscosity that you have, the more resistance to flow. So it's not going to flow as easily within your blood vessels. It's going to stick to the sides. It's going to stick to each other. Um, the second thing is, is vessel length. So the longer something is, the more resistance that it experiences over time. So you can think about um, a garden hose, for example, a short garden hose is going to uh, give less resistance than a, a longer garden hose. Um, the second, or final, finally, the, the third thing is vessel diameter. And this is actually something that's, that's probably uh, the most important influence in the body in terms of thinking about the flow of blood through your blood vessels um, it is this idea of diameter. Um, and so when you, you have a thinner vessel, it's providing more resistance. Um, and so we talked previously about the arterioles um, providing uh, what, what is referred to as peripheral resistance. So once you get down to those very small branches within the circulatory system, that's what's preventing flow throughout the body. And so if we look here, if you have a large uh, tube, it's going to provide low resistance. A, uh, a, a narrow tube with, with a small diameter, that's going to provide um, higher resistance. And you can think about this in terms of uh, drinking something like, like a milkshake, for example, um, or, e or even water. With, with a large straw, it's going to be a little bit easier to drink than with a very thin straw. And this is because there's resistance to flow. Okay, so there's resistance. In this case, you'd have resistance both in terms of the diameter. So diameter is the distance across the opening. And in this case, also the length as well. Okay. Um, 
We can also think of, of blood flow in quantitative uh, terms. Um, and so when we think about blood flow, what we want to be thinking about is what is making blood move from one area of the body, so probably around, around the heart, down to where it needs to go, so any given tissue. So you could use the muscles in your leg as an example. And the idea is that um, the flow of blood, which we represent here with F for flow, um, this is directly proportional to the difference in pressure. Um, and so that's, that's uh, indicated here by delta P. And so if you have a change in pressure, what we're referring to is what is the pressure up by the heart versus where it needs to go, okay? So if you have high pressure and low pressure, then fluid is always going to flow in the direction from high to low, okay? And this should be fairly intuitive. Um, so uh, if you have a hose and you have water coming out of the hose, the, it's, it's under high pressure at the tap, it's under lower pressure at the end of the hose. That's why it flows in that direction and not the other way around. In contrast, blood flow is inversely proportional to peripheral resistance. And so what this means is as the resistance uh, is going to uh, increase, the flow is going to decrease. So with this, this is where we get the equation flow is equal to the change in pressure or the difference in pressure, pressure gradient. Again, you can think of it as one area of the, the body, such as the heart, down to, to, the, to the muscle in your leg, for example, um, versus the, the resistance that it's experiencing. Okay, So resistance increases, blood flow is going to decrease. That's where we put it on uh, below here as a denominator. And so, uh, again, one of the biggest things to think about here is, is that resistance. This is really the important factor when we're talking about local blood flow. Um, and this is because we, we can actually change uh, resistance by changing the diameter of our blood vessels. So we can constrict our blood vessels, we can make them more narrow, or we can expand them. And that's going to change the flow to various tissues. And that's how your body changes which tissues get uh, most of the blood at any given time. Um, and so the basic idea here then is that the heart is generating uh, blood flow. It's going to generate high pressure and uh, the resistance is going to occur down by um, uh, your tissues where those uh, arteries are narrowing, okay? And so that's where the steepest drop in uh, your blood pressure is going to occur is down in the arterioles. So that's where those, uh, those um, vessels are getting very, very small. Um, and so your systemic pressure is always going to be highest right at the heart in the aorta, and it's de going to decline as things move down through the body. Okay. Um, and so uh, this is what this looks like. And so just, just focus right now on the overall shape of this curve. Um, so this is overall blood pressure. It's measured in millimeters mercury. Okay. So this is the, the, uh, the pressure exerted by a column of mercury, which is a given height. And this is usually how we measure blood pressure. And so you see that things are, are very high up by the aorta. And once you reach the arterioles, where you see that really dramatic change in diameter, that's where uh, you're going to get a, a very large change in, um, in, in resistance. Okay? And as you get this very large change in resistance, uh, this is um, going to be, uh, correspond to a, a change in blood pressure. Okay? Um, and as we go through the system here, so again, you see that the pressure is highest up by the aorta. It's, it drops significantly down by the arterioles. And by the time we get to the, to, the, to the venules and the veins, and then back to the heart on the other side through the vena cava, the pressure is actually uh, very low. And last time we actually talked about some adaptations that the venous or return system, or these capacitance vessels, have to enable that blood to keep flowing despite the low pressure. Okay. The other thing that you'll notice here is that uh, there, there's kind of two pressures. There's systolic pressure and there's a diastolic pressure. And so your blood is under one pressure when the heart is contracting and it's under a different pressure when the heart is relaxing. And so that's what these two things represent. And so systolic is 120 millimeters mercury, diastolic is 80 millimeters mercury. And that's a good 
approximate of what it exists as in your body. And so if you go to the clinic and they say, oh, your blood pressure looks good, we're 120 over 80, that's what they're referring to. So they're taking two measurements. One is the systolic pressure, the other is the diastolic pressure. Of course, within your body, we actually talked about how you have these very elastic arteries here. So we talked about three types of arteries, if you remember. There's the elastic arteries, uh, the muscular arteries, and, and finally the arterioles. The, um, the elastic arteries, you know, these things like the, the aorta, um, they have a lot of give to them. And so overall, you, you, you sense kind of a, a, a mean pressure. So you're able to maintain a mean pressure despite the fact that uh, your body is pulsing with these uh, contractions and relaxations associated with the contraction and the relaxation of the heart. Okay, and again, that's referred to as systolic pressure and diastolic pressure. So what is the mean pressure? Um, it's not simply an average of the two at any one point. Um, it's actually a little bit more of a complex formula, and we'll get to that in a second. And this is because the heart actually spends more time uh, relaxing than it does contracting, and so it's not simply an average of the two. And so if you look at the position of this line, it's if it was a strict average, then it would start at about 100 here, because the average of 120 and 80 is about 100. It's not about 100, it is 100. Um, and so um, the mean pressure is actually less than that, and again, that's because uh, the diastolic pressure has more of a contribution because the heart is spending a longer time in relaxation. And again, look at the overall shape of the curve. It's high at the aorta. This is the pressure that's driving blood flow. What's countering blood flow is resistance. What's providing most of that resistance? It's the very dramatic change in diameter that occurs at the arterioles, okay? And so uh, this is occurring in this region here. You see a very steep drop. Pressure, blood pressure that is promoting flow is very low when we get to the venous system. And this is why the venous system has to have these various adaptations to promote continuous flow. Okay, so we're gonna uh, look through each of these and, and look at the, the, the players involved in regulating blood pressure and how it impacts the physiology of the arteries. And we'll be talking about the systemic arteries for the most part. Um, so when we talk about systemic arteries, these are mostly the, the muscular arteries and the arterioles. Um, the, again, the muscular arteries, these are most of the named arteries. The capillaries, we'll talk about uh, how pressure impacts movement through capillaries, and then the systemic system. And again, when we focus on the systemic system in terms of veins, we're gonna be talking mostly about the adaptations such as these valves, which allow blood to move in one direction, even though there's a very low pressure. Okay, um, so within the arteries, um, blood pressure is really regulated by, by two factors. One is the elasticity of the arteries um, close to the heart, and the other is the, the, the volume of them that is forced into them at any one time, okay? Um, and that should make sense. So how much are you able to balloon in and out, um, and how much uh, blood is actually forced into them? And it should be fairly intuitive that, that pressure is going to depend on the amount of blood within the system. And also we'll see one of the ways that you can regulate blood pressure in the long term is by regulating the volume of your blood. Um, so we already went over this a little bit, I guess, but the idea is that blood pressure near the heart is, is pulsatile. So what this means is it's referring to this idea of systolic and diastolic uh, pressure, contraction, and relaxation. 120 over 80, okay? And as I mentioned, you can take a mean arterial pressure um, based on those two values. So you go to the clinic, they say you're at 120 over 80. That seems pretty good. Um, but you can also calculate a mean arterial pressure for the purpose of understanding how blood is going to flow through the rest of the body, okay? Um, and so, so um, this is uh, um, particularly important when we think about uh, what's happening down by the small arteries. Basically, the flow is more consistent. It's non-pulsatile. Um, and, and this, again, is because of the elasticity of those vessels and the fact that you're able to get that mean arterial pressure. So as I mentioned, if we're trying to calculate mean arterial pressure, again, we're talking how do we take the, the kind of functional average of systolic and diastolic pressure. We have to take into account the fact that the heart spends more time in um, relaxation 
than it does in contraction. So um, it's 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 going to spend more time here in systole, um, uh, or sorry, it's going to spend more time here in diastole um, or diastole when it's um, relaxing as opposed to uh, contraction. Okay, so it's not just a simple average. Um, so again, just make sure everybody's on the same page. Usually we're at 120 over 80 in terms of our pressures when we're at systolic pressure and diastolic pressure, um, but we can take a mean or average pressure. And this is particularly important down when you get to these regions where you don't really detect this pulsating uh, feature. Okay, um, And this pressure is going to drop when we get to the arterioles. And this is because we see this very dramatic change in, in diameter of those blood vessels. Okay, so I've been talking about this calculation probably for too long. How do we actually do it? And so a sample calculation for mean arterial pressure is this. Let's assume we have um, a blood pressure of 120 over 80, um, so systolic and diastolic. Um, and it's no accident we use this. This is considered normal, although normal, as you'll see in physiology, has a variety of ranges, but we'll stick with this just for illustration purposes. Um, and so first thing that you want to do is to, to calculate the pulse pressure. And this is because the mean arterial pressure is calculated by adding the diastolic pressure to one third of the pulse pressure. So we know the diastolic pressure, the diastolic pressure is, is, is 80. Okay, that's just measured. So what is the pulse pressure? The pulse pressure is simply going to be uh, the systolic pressure minus the diastolic pressure. Um, and so if you take 120 minus 80, get out your calculator, give it a try, it equals to 40. And so if we plug this 40 back into this equation here, then we have 80 plus one third of 40 um, equals 80 plus about 13. And that's going to end up being 93 millimeters mercury. So this shows you how to do the calculation uh, to detect mean arterial pressure. So this is the average pressure dictating blood flow, particularly down in your, your uh, arteries where they begin to branch into smaller and smaller divisions. Um, and uh, this is how you do that calculation. Okay. So again, pulse pressure is 120 minus 80 is going to equal to 40. And then we take one third of that, add it back to the diastolic pressure, and uh, that's going to end up equaling 93 millimeters mercury. Okay. Um, so Let's take a little side trip here and look at uh, what is into the into the clinic and say what is actually a pulse. Um, and so, so basically, a pulse is the the throbbing or um, or expanding and contracting that occurs during systole uh, uh, as the ventricle contraction forces blood into those elastic arteries and expands them. Okay, and this expansion and contraction can be detected at various points in the body. So usually over some sort of a tendon or a bone or these types of things. And so you probably know that there's points where you can read your pulse in the neck, but also in, in your wrist, for example, and in other areas of the body. Um, so how do we measure it? We measure it uh, by something called an osculatory uh, sphygmometer. Um, and so this is something that uh, I'm sure you've all had done. It's very similar to that machine in Shopper's Drug Mart that you go and you stick your arm into. Um, while you're waiting for your prescription. Um, and basically what this what this does is it will increase the pressure until it exceeds the systolic pressure in your brachial artery. So brachial just means arm. It's the artery within your arm. The pressure is slowly released and you'll listen for these what are called sounds of Kuratov. Okay, and you can listen for these using a stethoscope or the machine will, will detect it for you if you're at Schomper's Drug Mart, sticking your hand in that machine. And so uh, the ideal result with this is that systolic pressure is usually, um, again, going to be about 120 or less. And when you're listening for these, these uh, unique sounds, this is uh, kind of the first sounds that you hear as the blood kind of kind of spurts through the, the open artery. Okay, and The diastolic pressure is when the sounds are going to, to disappear. So that's how we get a reading in the clinic or at the doctor's office or at the pharmacy of 120 over 80. Again, this represents the systolic pressure, the diastolic pressure, the mean arterial pressure that is promoting flow through the body. This is going to be um, what we'll call a functional average of those. 
And so it's not just an arithmetic average, because that would be a 100. We take into account that the heart spends more time in uh, the diastolic phase. Um, and that's how we have that, that equation that we talked about over here. So that's where we get mean arterial pressure is going to end, end up equaling 93 millimeters mercury when we have systolic and diastolic pressures of 120 over 80, respectively. Okay, um, so that's what's going on in the arteries. What's going on in the in the capillaries? Um, in the capillaries, there is uh, the pressure is usually about 35 millimeters mercury um, at the beginning of the capillary bed. Now, now you might be thinking, well, that's that's much different than this 93 um, mean arterial pressure, but that's because it's traveled all along the body, and so the pressure is lower. Just again, same with the hose. The pressure is, is very high towards the nozzle, and it's going to decrease as you go the length of the garden hose. Um, and it's once you get to the other end of the capillary bed, it's at 17 millimeters mercury. And when we start talking about some of the functions in the lung and picking up oxygen, we'll see that this difference between 35 and 17, even though it's not that much in the context of the 120 over 80, that little difference is what drives things in and out of the capillary beds in the correct direction um, in those tissues. So that's what allows you to dump off uh, things like oxygen and pick up things like carbon dioxide that gets br brought back up to the, uh, to the heart to be sent back to the lungs for, to, to expel that waste. Um, so, so we'll revisit that when we talk in more depth in, in the section related to lung function in physiology. Um, so 35, again, even at the, the beginning of the capillary bed, so to speak, this is much higher, or sorry, much lower than the, the 93 average mean arterial pressure. This is really uh, desirable, and it's desirable because those capillaries, again, we talked about them being very thin, very fragile. In some cases, you don't even have kind of uh, cells which are joined tightly together. We have those gap junctions, but not all cells have them, and there, there's spaces between those cells. Um, and so very high blood pressure might rupture these very thin-walled capillaries. And so that's why this low pressure is actually a good thing. Despite the fact that it's low pressure, uh, we know that capillaries are permeable. Uh, so they have those, those, um, those gaps between the endothelial cells. Some of them have fenestrations or windows, and others actually have those very large sinuses or large holes in them. And so even a very large or low pressure difference can force what we call the filtrate into their interstitial spaces. So what is an interstitial space? That's just the space between the blood vessels and the cell that is making up a tissue. So if something goes out of the capillary bed, it goes... Uh, between two cells first, and then it gets taken up into the muscle, for example. So that's what we're referring to when we talk about the interstitial space. So, so it's very uh, straightforward. So again, that low pressure is actually something that is very, very desirable um, because it protects our capillaries, and it's good enough. Low pressure is fine to do what we need to do at the area of the capillaries. What about the veins? Uh, the veins actually uh, have very little change in uh, pressure throughout the cardiac cycle. So what is the cardiac cycle? It's that nice complicated diagram we've gone over a bunch of times now where we have the blood flow, we have the volume changes, the pressure, which might make a little bit more sense with this lecture, um, and, and the electrical changes in the heart with the, with the EKG. Um, and so one way that, you, one way that, that um, we know this is true is that if you cut a vein, uh, you will see that the, the in contrast to an artery where the blood might kind of spurt out, you see with a vein that because things under, are under low pressure, that the uh, you're going to have the blood which is essentially flowing out very smoothly. Okay, um, and so that's the difference between a, a vein and an artery in that scenario. Uh, why is it a low pressure? It's a low pressure because you, you've gone through the entire system at this point. You've gone through the arteries, the arterioles. The arterioles is where you have that very dramatic drop. In, in pressure, and this is because of that resistance, because of the dramatic change in diameter. Um, by the time you get to the other end of the capillary bed, then, then, then you've accumulated that peripheral resistance over time, you've decreased blood flow, um, and you've decreased the pressure. So you have this low pressure system, but, but 
the 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 fluid the blood still flows and it does this again because it's got these various adaptations that allow you to return that venous blood to the heart again we want to get that blood to the heart because we have to pump it back to the lungs to be oxygenated and then back to the heart and then out to the rest of the body so again we talked about a number of these there's skeletal muscle so you move around that's going to promote uh, venous return um, there's uh, the respiratory system also helps. So as you breathe, it, it contracts and relaxes some of the larger veins in your body, and that will help to, pro to propel the blood forward. Um, there's smooth muscle control in the veins as well. Um, and then there is also valves. So we talked a lot about these valves, how blood can go through the valve. Um, and uh, once it goes through in one direction, it can't then go back in the other direction unless, of course, there's damage to these valves. And so we talked about that in terms of varicose veins, for example, okay? So, so these are the different uh, control mechanisms that allow blood to flow in a single direction. Um, so uh, that's a little bit about how we, we regulate or think about regulation of uh, blood flow and blood pressure in the arteries, capillaries, and veins. Um, now we're gonna do a little bit more uh, math to try to figure out how cardiac output, which we talked about previously, um, is linked to, to pressure and resistance. And so previously we talked about cardiac output uh, being equal to um, heart rate times stroke volume in the heart. So everything's starting to get connected here. Um, but uh, it's also the case that cardiac output is also equal to blood flow. Okay, and that's just kind of the definition of what it is. The, the amount that your, your, your heart outputs, that's gonna be the flow through the system, and that's fairly intuitive. So then with that, we can start to combine some equations, okay? Um, so if cardiac output equals the flow of blood, well, in just a few slides ago, we said that flow equals delta P, so change in pressure over resistance, okay? Um, so it's proportional to the pressure difference, and it's inversely proportional to the uh, change in resistance. But these two guys are equal, so we can simply get rid of this and put in cardiac output. Therefore, we see that cardiac output also equals change in pressure over resistance, and then you can arrange the equation to get whatever you want. So a change in pressure, for example, is equal to the cardiac output over resistance. The point here is that because this is true, you can start to compensate for changes in blood pressure, for example, by changing cardiac output, so how fast your heart is beating or how strong of a contraction you have, or resistance. Resistance you can change, as I said, by changing the diameter of some of those arterioles. If you change the diameter of the arterioles, then you're gonna create more resistance or less resistance, and again, that can impact pressure. And the whole point here is that you want to control blood pressure to make sure that enough blood is getting to where it needs to go in any given circumstance. So again, with this, we can start to see that, that all sorts of these things are connected. And so last time, um, we talked about stroke volume and heart rate. Uh, uh, if you times these two together, then that's what gives the cardiac output. But you can see that we can also link what we learned last time when we were talking about the heart uh, to, to all of these other factors which impact peripheral resistance. So the diameter of the blood vessel, viscosity, a little bit at least, and blood vessel length. Again, of these three, if I was to ask you which is the most important, it's always gonna be this uh, diameter. And so again, cardiac output, peripheral resistance, that's what's gonna impact mean arterial pressure. If your blood pressure goes up or if your blood pressure goes down and you want to reverse it for one reason, or if your body wants to reverse it, you don't have too, too much control over this, uh, then you can change how your heart is functioning or you can change how uh, much peripheral resistance you have. And in most cases, this is done by changing the diameter of your blood vessels. So let's take a closer look at how all that actually happens. We're gonna look at three types of controls to regulate blood pressure. Uh, we're gonna look at what are called short-term uh, neuronal controls, short-term hormonal controls, um, and uh, then we're gonna look at long-term regulation, and that consists of hormonal controls and renal controls.
Okay, um, so we'll hit these one at a time, um, and we'll start off with looking at short-term uh, neural controls. Okay, so how do you control your blood pressure in a very short period of time? Again, it's going to involve some regulation of both of these, either your, either your cardiac output or your peripheral resistance. And because it's comes from, from these guys, it's going to also come up here from regulating either the stroke volume, heart rate, and then mostly the diameter of your blood vessels. There's not too, too much you can do about your blood viscosity or your blood vessel length. Okay. So short-term control, we're going to focus first on the neural controls. Uh, the basic uh, idea behind this is that you can regulate, neural mechanisms are going to, to regulate blood pressure by focusing on, on resistance. So again, the resistance is going to be mostly the diameter of those blood vessels or the cardiac output. Okay, um, And again, the, the idea here is that this is always going to regulate um, or involve regulation by these overlapping pathways that we discussed on the previous slide. And why, why do you want to do this? Again, the idea is that you want to get blood uh, to all the organs that it's supposed to be at when it's supposed to be at those. Okay, um, And so the example that's given in the book is that if your blood volume drops, all your vessels will constrict. If your vessels uh, constrict, then that's going to uh, increase pressure and allow it to get to where it needs to go. Okay. Um, so how is all this controlled? Um, well, it's controlled by those same cardiac centers that we talked about previously. So these are located in the medulla oblongata. Uh, we talked about the medulla oblongata as being a lower um, area of the brain. And this makes sense because this isn't really something that you have to think about. You can't really get too creative uh, when you're thinking about how um, your heart rate or blood pressure should be changed over time in response to various stimuli. Okay, so this is, this is all kind of these automated functions of your, of your system. Um, if you remember, we had the cardiac inhibitory center and the cardiac accelerator center. Uh, we talked a lot about this vagus nerve previously as inhibiting the SA node. Um, but these guys can also uh, have, there's also the accelerator center, and the accelerator center can control things like uh, how hard your, your heart can contract, for example. Um, and again, this is going to be important because the strength of these contractions uh, as an example, is what's going to regulate um, the, the output of your heart. So as your stroke volume increases, then the cardiac output is going to increase as well, and that is going to increase blood pressure. Okay. Um, and so the basic idea here is that um, in terms of, of neuronal control is that you have these kind of sympathetic or parasympathetic neurons within these uh, cardiovascular centers. Again, sympathetic, this is, this is action, this is fight or flight, these types of things. Parasympathetic, this is what we refer to as kind of the rest and digest system. Uh, this is, is providing usually inhibitory functions, okay? Um, and so uh, these are the, uh, when you have these cardiovascular centers, we talked about previously that you have the cardio, cardiac centers, the, the cardio inhibitory and the cardio accelerator centers. So these are these guys that I mentioned on the previous slide here. And we talked about previously how they inhibit the SA node and the AV node or, or vice versa. Um, you also have the, um, uh, the vasomotor center. And it's the vasomotor center that is, is controlled by sympathetic uh, neurons, sympathetic efferents. These were referred to as vasomotor fibers. And these impact the uh, blood vessels all throughout your body. So we're moving away from the heart now. We've talked about the cardiac centers, uh, and we're talking about the vasomotor center. Vasomotor center has sympathetic efferents. They're called vasomotor fibers. And the function of all of this is to provide what's called vasomotor tone. So it's going to be telling these blood vessels constantly to contract. And it's going to make sure that those um, vessels are contracting to keep blood pressure high. If we relax the blood vessel, then the diameter is going to increase and then pressure is going to decrease. So as we contract, pressure is going to increase. As we relax, pressure is going to decrease. And these vasomotor centers, um, these are going to be under the command of various receptors throughout the body that monitor blood pressure. 
And these can be called baroreceptors, which are, are sensing pressure, uh, but also ke chemoreceptors, and in some cases, some higher brain centers. And so we'll take a quick look at each of those. So um, first of all, we'll talk about the, the baroreceptors. So baroreceptors are um, stretch receptors. Um, most often we associate with these with being in, in what are called the carotid sinuses. So that's this area here in your neck. Um, you have these, these uh, pressure receptors. And so if you have increased blood pressure, it's gonna force this to give negative input to the, um, to the vasomotor center, okay? Um, basically, it's going to stimulate your cardioinhibitory center and inhibit the cardioaccelerator center. And that's going to prevent these kind of uh, 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 basal tone or this vasomotor tone. Okay. And so, again, you're going to have these pressure receptors in your neck. And when these are activated, there's going to be ner nerves that go up to your vasomotor center and your cardioaccelerator centers and it's going to result ultimately in decreased blood pressure, okay? And it does this by uh, causing changes in the way that those, um, those arterioles are either expanded or contracted all throughout your entire body. So although this is something that's sensed in this region, uh, the, the uh, cardiac and vasomotor centers that are stimulated in your abdulla oblongata, these are going to respond and uh, give outputs to your entire body. Okay, and it's going to be functioning on those arterioles and your, your arteries, and it's going to be telling them to either contract or relax, depending on whether the blood pressure is high or low. Okay, so um, so here's an example again: stretch receptors in the in the carotid sinuses. If your blood pressure is low, um, you know, let's look at what happens. So an example might be as if you if you fall up, or if you stand up uh, suddenly, what happens is that those uh, carotid sinuses are gonna sense this drop in blood pressure. Um, and um, there's also, uh, uh, this is also um, present in the aortic, uh, in the aorta as well. So there's also baroreceptors in, in the aorta as well as in the carotid sinuses. And both of these are basically going to sense that your blood pressure has dropped. It's gonna send a signal to your, um, to your vasomotor center in the abdulla oblongata and that's going to then send uh, signals down to the rest of your body saying, constrict, constrict, constrict. Let's get that blood pressure back up. Okay. So this is actually a, a really good diagram in 19.11. Um, you can see how all these different factors that we're beginning to talk about uh, come together. And if you read through kind of the, the system here, you can um, see how a stimulus such as a rise in arterial blood pressure will trigger activation of baroreceptors uh, up to the brain and then down to both the heart and to, to the blood vessels. And so this diagram summarizes what happens when you have high blood pressure and also what happens when you have low blood pressure. And so all these things are connected together and uh, you have this balance that is maintained by these cardiac and vasomotor centers in that Abdullah oblongata region of the brain. Okay. Um, so baroreceptors, these are, are going to, to uh, uh, sense pressure. There is also a chemoreceptor reflexes, um, and this can be, uh, for, for example, uh, changes in oxygen or carbon dioxide. And the idea here is that if you have changes in oxygen or carbon dioxide, then you can change um, the diameter of certain blood vessels in order to increase or decrease flow to the lungs, okay? Um, and so if you have a net increase in carbon dioxide or a drop in oxygen or a drop in pH of your blood, what will happen is that this will be sensed as uh, an increase um, or this will, will promote the body to, to uh, increase blood pressure. You're going to get uh, signaling to that cardio accelerator center. What is that going to do? That's going to increase heart rate and stroke volume. That's going to cause an increase in cardiac output. And then you're also going to signal to your vasomotor center to increase vasoconstriction. So you're gonna increase resistance. You're increasing uh, cardiac output and you're increasing uh, resistance. Then uh, what you're going to be doing is uh, you're gonna be increasing blood pressure. And this is important for getting that blood to the lungs.
Okay, so this is an example of how chemoreceptors can complement those baroreceptors. Where are baroreceptors found? Baroreceptors are found in the aorta, uh, but also in the uh, carotid sinuses. And chemoreceptors here, we're listing them as being in the aortic arch, in the large arteries of the neck as well. Okay, so baroreceptors, pressure, chemoreceptors, chemicals. And, and it's easiest to think about when we're, we're thinking about carbon dioxide or oxygen or pH, which is also dependent on carbon dioxide as well. Um, okay, so that covers um, uh, short-term regulation of uh, by your, your lower brain centers, so the, the cardio um, accelerator centers, uh, the cardiac centers, and the vasomotor neurons in your medulla oblongata. Now we're going to be talking just a little bit about the neural control from higher brain centers. And the basic idea here is pretty simple. This is fight or flight. And so as you, you uh, respond to something in your environment, we know that this can increase blood pressure. This basically gets blood to where it needs to go. In this case, it's to the, um, it's to the uh, muscle so this guy can run away with, from whatever he is uh, facing. Um, so again, higher brain centers, uh, you have um, these will, will signal down to, to the hypothalamus. Um, and this can, can regulate blood flow during exercise. Um, hypothalamus will increase blood pressure during stress. And this is what we just saw. Um, and again, these are always going to be signaling down through the, uh, through the medulla. Okay. And so these are always going to be going down through the medulla oblongata in this region here. So whatever is happening up here is going to go down through this area here as well. Okay. Um, so, so what I just said here is that you have the hypothalamus and the cerebral cortex. Um, these will signal down through these same cardiovascular centers that we were talking about. Okay. Um, and so hypothalamus will mediate uh, uh, blood flow from uh, exercise and body temperature. Um, and uh, it'll be involved, uh, at least in some ways, about regulating blood pressure during stress. Your higher cortical areas uh, can also uh, signal through these areas as well. Okay. Um, so so that, that basically does it for the short-term regulation in terms of neural controls. Now we're going to talk a little bit about short-term regulation in terms of hormonal controls. Um, and, and really we're just going to touch on this uh, because most of the hormonal controls actually function in long-term regulation and we're going to focus on that in, in the next lecture. So let's back up a little bit. What actually is a hormone? A hormone is a, is a thing that's a substance that, that's produced uh, by the body. It can be uh, stored in blood or, or sap. So why sap? Well, well, plants actually have hormones as well. Um, and this can stimulate various cells or, or tissues um, into action. And so a hormone could be a lipid, so a fat. It could be amino acid um, or it could be a peptide. Peptides, of course, are made of amino acids as well. So usually, again, we think of hormones as regulating uh, blood pressure in the short term, uh, uh, or in the long term, sorry, um, the few effects that hormones do have in the short term are, are usually uh, through regulation of what we're referring to as peripheral resistance. When we talk next lecture about long term regulation, we're going to talk about hormones regulating blood pressure in terms of changes in blood volume. So um, there's a lot of different hormones. And they do, they, do, um, they do different things, and they, they act in different areas. So uh, there's the uh, adrenal hormones. These are the ones that are released during stress, and we've seen these before, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Again, for this course, you could consider those the same, at least from the perspective of my slides. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about uh, how those can promote increase in cardiac output and vasoconstriction in a second, and you've seen this before. There's also other ones that, that we're going to come back to when we talk about long-term effects. So there's antidiuretic hormone, um, not usually a short-term effector, but it can, uh, can at very high levels, it can cause vasoconstriction. Atrial natriuretic uh, peptide, um, or AMP, this can decrease blood pressure by antagonizing aldosterone. And we're going to talk about that when we're, we're talking about long-term regulation. Uh, but it it's also uh, provides uh, the opposite effect to uh, ADH. It can, it can provide a vasodilation in the short term. Angiotensin, uh, 
stimulates constriction in the short term. Again, better characterized as part of the long-term system. So all these ones in black here, ADH, AMP, and angiotensin II, we're going to talk about in more detail next lecture when we talk about long-term regulation. The one that I'll just highlight again for you guys is epinephrine and norepinephrine. And how are these working? They're working through this mechanism that we went through previously when we talked about cardiac output. Why are they important here? They're important here because cardiac output is linked to pressure. So cardiac output and resistance, that's what's going to be regulating blood pressure. And so we've seen this before. So epinephrine and norepinephrine can bind to receptors. Receptors will stimulate exchange of GDP for GTP. This will activate adenylate cyclase to produce CAMP. CAMP is used by a kinase, which takes phosphates from ATP and puts them onto individual proteins. Some of these include things like uh, various channels. Uh, so this can be uh, um, uh, in the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium or to import calcium uh, from the environment. And this is important for contraction of the heart, cardiac output. This same system is going to function in vasoconstriction. Okay, So this same system will promote uh, contraction of your, uh, of your very small arteries, decreasing their overall diameter. And when you decrease their overall diameter, you're going to increase resistance and increase blood pressure. During stress, that's what you want to do. So epinephrine, norepinephrine, released during stress, promote basal constriction. All these other guys are ones that we're going to be talking about in, in a little bit greater detail uh, when we talk about a long-term regulation in the next lecture. Uh, there's a great table um, in 19.2 in the textbook um, that talks about the effects of these, um, uh, these various uh, uh, hormones. Again, most of these you'll see, most of the dramatic effects are through changes in, in blood volume, and it's uh, uh, changes in blood volume which are going to be uh, uh, controlling long-term regulation of, of blood pressure. The short-term effects are going to be on the heart, so cardiac output, stroke volume, heart rate, or on the arterioles. When we're talking about arterioles, we're really talking about constriction or relaxation, uh, the diameter of those arterioles, because again, diameter is what is going to increase resistance. So for the rest of the lecture, we just have some more of these review questions. Again, I will post these on the site um, and you can go over them. Um, so the summary of today is we started to look at uh, uh, regulation of blood flow. This is something we refer to as hemodynamics. Um, and, and what I want you to focus on, again, is how we can begin to connect cardiac output, uh, blood pressure, and, and um, uh, resistance, because this is what it defines um, how we control the flow of blood through the body. Okay, So by changing cardiac output, either stroke volume or heart rate, or by changing the diameter of some of these arterial vessels, uh, we can change where blood goes in the body at any one given time. This is important uh, for regular operation of the body, but also to respond to stress. This stress could be, you know, being lightheaded when we stand up. We want to constrict our blood vessels to get blood to where it needs to go. Um, it can be about getting uh, our blood to the lungs to, to drop off more carbon dioxide or pick up more oxygen. Or it can be about uh, getting our blood to our muscles in order to run away if there's some sort of a stress. Okay. Um, so the, the next next class, uh, it won't necessarily be a Monday, this is an old slide, but we're going to finish off this section on, uh, on blood vessels. And uh, uh, next week I'll also post a lecture related to um, a system known as the lymphatic system. Okay, so just be one lecture on lymphatics. Um, as always, you can contact me with any questions that you have, and I will see you next time.